All right, the Sermon on the Mount was really in the process of choosing the 12. Now, I want you to take a moment and mark it out this way. In chapter 5, you have the character traits of a disciple. I would write that next to 5.1 if I were you, unless you're going to just remember this, you know, um, along with the other 1,189 chapters. Um, the character traits of a disciple. That's in chapter 5. And I'm, we're going to review them in just a minute. This, in chapter 6, 1 to 7, 12, this is a three-point sermon, by the way. I should have told you that. Character traits is point one. 6, 1 to 7, 12 is the commitments of a true disciple. And in 7, 13 to 29, the choices of a true disciple. And they're all C's because I'm a preacher. Okay? So we got character traits. Now here's the question. What are the four character traits of the disciples that he offers them? And, and when you look at it, it says, Jesus went up to, uh, saw the crowds, went up into a mountain. Now look at the note that he sat down. Circle sat down and mark it out that when a rabbi stands, he reads the scriptures, but when he sits down, he gives the proposition of his sermon. So follow Jesus wherever he sits down. And by the way, it's terribly annoying because sometimes I'm sure he just sat down because he wanted to sit down. But every time he sits down, they come to him. Yes? Yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm sitting. Oh, okay. But, but this is what a rabbi does. So when he comes to teach, he sits down and the teaching is from a sitting position. And what he does is he may get up and walk around afterwards, but the proposition, the key principle is given while he's sitting. So you're going to see over and over the phrase, he sat down and taught them saying. Sometimes he goes out in a boat and he'll sit down and they all go. And they're waiting for what comes next. Okay. Now, he gives a series in the first, in the next verses down through uh, about verse 12. He gives a series of eight descriptions. Can I put them all into one idea? In the verses, uh, verses uh, 2 through 12, you can't be about you and be about me. You can't be about you and be about me. Let me see if I can, can actually pull that in. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It's actually the word bankrupt in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the gentle or the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. The merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. Those who have been persecuted for righteousness sake. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you uh, and falsely say all kinds of things of evil against you because of me. He says, listen. If you want to follow me, you have to be a person who doesn't feel self-sufficient. You have to feel bankrupt in spirit. People who are bankrupt in spirit don't think they have enough. When you look in your bank account and you're bankrupt, you're not feeling good about yourself. So you can't be about you and be about me. You need to look in the spirit in your life and say, I need Jesus. I want Jesus. I can't pull this off by myself. In other words, there are no smug Christians. The fact of the matter is, if you feel like you're good enough, then you don't know what Jesus is all about. Blessed are those who mourn. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Now, if you're, if you're happy and you feel like your life is full and complete, you're not going to want Jesus. you got to be hungry. By the way, if you're proud, you're not meek. If you're strong, you tend not to be merciful. If you're right, you're not a peacemaker. You don't make peace because you're right. There's what I believe and there's what everybody else believes and they're wrong. If you're the kind of person who can't accept a slap without fighting back, you can't be my disciple. In other words, the character that I'm looking for is somebody who's about me, not about yourself, Jesus says. He goes on and says in verse 13, you also, you can't, not only can't be about you and be about me at the same time, Remember that statement, no man can preach Christ and himself at the same time. In verse 13, you can't be alone. You cannot be alone. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt has become tasteless, how will it be salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under the foot of men. When I was studying in the um, Negev desert in the south part of Israel, every uh, meal they served you, you ate reclining. Now they pick up their salt from the Dead Sea. They don't get it from Morton in a shaker. You, you get it from the Dead Sea. It's a clump. 
and they'd pick up the clumps of salt and they'd put them in a bag. And when you were going to these Bedouin meals, these Arab meals where you recline, they would bring in this, this plate and it would have a dirt bomb on it that was salt and dirt mixed together because it came from the Dead Sea. And during the, meat, you, uh, during the uh, meal, you would pick out the uh, salt and you'd crush it and you'd put it on your meat and leave the dirt on the plate. At the end of the meal, the woman came in, picked up the plate, walked it out, threw it on the ground because the salt had lost its savor. Look, salt, if you put it away in a camp, campground for 10 years and come back, it'll still taste like salt. It'll never taste like sugar. The problem is not that the salt changes. The problem is that in the Bible, they're getting their salt, they're putting it on a plate, but it's dirt and salt mixed. But that's okay because there's a lot of dirt in the meat too. So it's going to be crunchy even if you don't put salt on it. We call it mystery meat. We don't really know what it is. But at any rate, the point is that you pick out the salt, you put it on the meat, you, you eat it, and then at the end, there's nothing left on the plate but mostly dirt and some salt. To test that theory, Dr. Ruth Amiron, when she was digging an early bronze arad, did a test in the street, and the saline content in the street was actually 10 times greater than it was in the house. So apparently people have been throwing salt out their door for a long time. So Jesus says, look, if the salt has been reduced to mostly dirt, what's left on the plate isn't really good for anything except for you throw it out in the, on the street. Now, what's the salt he's talking about? Uh, you remember Numbers 18? The covenant with the Levi Levites was a covenant of salt. It's a covenant of loyalty between God. Remember, we studied it when we were all the way back in Numbers about 500 years ago. And 1 Chronicles 13, you remember the second king of Judah is attacked by Jeroboam the first, and he says, don't you know that God has a covenant of salt with the household of David? God will be loyal to David. Salt is a symbol of loyalty in the Middle East. And right next to verse 13, Mark 9, 50. Because if you read Mark 9, 50, it says this in a different way. It says, it says if the salt loses its savor, it's good for nothing but to be cast under the foot of men. But then it says this, have salt in yourselves have peace with one another. You see it? So there's a loyalty involved. So the first 12 verses are you cannot be about you and be about me and be my disciple. I need you to be about me. I need you to write off your story, give your life to me and let me tell my story through your life and then you can be my disciple. But then right behind that he says in verse 13, and by the way, you can't pull this off alone. In other words, right in that salt statement is a, you're going to need each other. There is a loyalty and a bond that you're going to need between each other. In other words, Christianity flourishes when Christians get off their high horses and care about one another more than they care about their own reputation. In other words, we're going to have to, salt is a binder. It's what it does. It binds things together. Now, verses 14 to 16 says, there's a third thing i got to tell you. You can't be a Christianus incognitus. There's no such thing as a secret Christian. If you're a Christian, people know it. And if they don't know it, you're probably not one. You don't need a big t-shirt or a bumper sticker. You need a life. So get a life. Bumper stickers are cheap, but lives are important. So here's what he says. You're, a, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Everybody follow what he's saying? You are going to be light, and um, you can't hide. You want to be my disciple? You're not allowed to hide. It's got to be obvious. And, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, so it gives light to all those who are in the house. In other words, I'm calling you so that I can use your life to shine truth into other people's lives. If you're going to hide it, you're totally ineffective and cannot be my disciple. I don't need you to just know stuff. I need you to live stuff. If you're not going to live stuff, then I don't care if you know it. Because knowing it isn't going to help anybody. I don't need people walking around with big brains filled with Bible. I need a, the Bible wasn't meant to be just studied. It was meant to be lived. I need you to get it to your hands and feet. Otherwise, all the theory in the world isn't going to change anybody. He, he's being very direct with them. He's saying, look, you want to follow me? Then be about me. You want to follow me? Then, then don't do it alone. Get together. Be loyal to one another. You want to follow me? Don't try to be in secret because it isn't going to work. And then he says, 
He says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do you see how clearly he says that the light he's talking about is the work of their hands? In other words, show your faith by what you do, not by the t-shirt on your body. Now, he gets down here and he uses salt and light. And then he says, all right, I need to tell you something else. You can't be about you and about me. You can't be alone. You can't be secret. But there's, the fourth one is really tough. You can't waffle. You can't flip-flop. You need to know where the standard comes from. And by the way, this is from verses 17 to 48. It's all about one thing. You need to be consistent. You cannot waffle. Let me tell you the standard of what a disciple is, as, as Jesus says, from Jesus' own mouth. He says, do not think I came to, the word abolish is actually a word for uh, to uproot. Do not think that I came to uproot the law. I did not come to uproot the law or the prophets. I did not come to say, by the way, I used to think that's wrong, but now I don't, because I used to be the mean God and now I'm the gracious one. I hear that taught, but it's just plain nonsense. He says, I didn't come to uproot the law. I came rather to do what? Fulfill it, but it does not mean to keep it and thereby retire it, because that's the way fulfill is taught in a lot of Sunday school classes. Jesus never kept any of the laws on marriage. He never got married. Never kept a single parenting law. He wasn't a parent. In other words, a lot of laws that regard, he never actually, we have no record that he ever checked mold on his tent. We have no idea whether or not half the laws that are in there he ever had anything to do with. He didn't say, I came to do them and thereby retire them and now give you grace in the place of law. What it says, fulfill is a word, it comes from the idea of setting an arm or a leg. I came to put the bone back where it belongs so that you will understand what I meant when I said it. Jesus is the same Jesus at Sinai as at the Mount of Beatitudes. But here's what he says. I didn't come to tear the law out. I came to tell you that you got the list but missed the point. According to verse 17, where, where, does, where does Jesus say the disciples get their standard? The law and so the law gave you the mind of God, the prophets gave you the broken heart of God. So you get it from the mind and heart of God in the law, but does that mean i got to kill a goat to make God happy? Zoe, do I have to kill a goat to make God happy? Well, why not? How can I get a standard of discipleship and follow Jesus from the law if I don't kill a goat? That's the word I wanted. In principle, God gave the law to whom he gave it. I'm not, I'm not a Jew. I'm not an Israelite. I never swore I was going to do it, and I eat ham deal with it. At the same time, the principles of that law are principles of a timeless God. So by identifying the law, I identify what my father cares about. I identify what areas of life he wants to be involved in. Now, early in the year, you guys were knee-deep in law, and I trust you haven't lost that sense that that really tells you how God thinks. Now, here's the point. I didn't come to dismiss that. I didn't come to write the New Testament and tell you that the Old Testament was old stuff for dead Jews, and it's a really good paperweight, and what you should learn is the will of God and the New Testament. That is exactly what we're doing. And it's exactly what Jesus said I didn't come to do. What I came to do was take the law and the prophets as I was saying them, give you the principles that I want you to know, and have you live my discipleship life by reflecting what I said. The problem is, you heard it said, but you didn't hear it said. Let, let me try a couple of those. You know, the, you, you understand where I'm going with this? Law bad, grace good. You want to get under my skin, that's the fastest way to do it? That's a huge problem. Okay, let's try like, um, let's try a couple of these. Look at the laws that are referenced. I want you to circle the verse numbers that I tell you, okay? In 521, circle 521, just the 21 at the beginning of 521. Circle the 21. And that's the law, thou shalt not kill. In 527, circle the 27. That's the thou shalt not commit adultery. In verse 31, that's the law of divorce. In verse 33, do not forswear yourself. That is the law of the oaths. 
38. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's the law of the scales. 43. Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. What? That's the first one that went off the reservation. It's not actually in the Bible. The Bible doesn't say love your neighbor and hate your enemy. However, in the Qumran scrolls, the Pharisees said that. It was something well taught. That there are our people, us, and them. And we love us and we eschew them. An old biblical term for we just don't want to be with them. Okay? All right, now here's the problem. Let's go back to verse 21. Thou shalt not kill. Are we all absolutely certain that this is still wrong? Okay, because I'm in the room and I turn my back to you and I just want to know if we're all on the same page that killing is absolutely wrong. Okay? So when he says, when he says to them, you have heard of the ancients to say, you shall not commit murder. Whoever commits murder will be liable to the court. But I say unto you, what he's not saying is, you heard the don't kill, but I've got something new. He's not saying, oh, by the way, I used to think that's wrong and now I think it's okay. What he's saying is you never actually listened to what I said. You heard it said, don't kill. But here's what I was trying to say. Let me tell you a larger principle that I was trying to give you. Everybody who's angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Whoever says to his brother, you're good for nothing, will be guilty before the Supreme Court. Whoever says, you fool, are guilty enough to, be, to go into fiery hell. Therefore, if you're presenting your offering at the altar and you remember your brother has something against you, drop the gift. Be reconciled to your brother. Then come and present the offering. You heard it said, don't kill. I say to you, become responsible for the relationships of your life. If you've wounded somebody, make it right first. That's more important than your temple worship. If you're walking around creating strife between you and brothers, you need to know that there is no way, no way that that's godly. And that's what I meant when I said don't kill. You think if you didn't sharpen a knife and stick it in somebody, you weren't killing them, and I'm telling you, you can do it with your mouth. You don't even need a knife. You can do it with your heart. You don't even need a knife. See, I said this, but what I meant was this principle. Be a person who understands the value of human relationships because I'm all about relationships, says the Lord. Okay? Now see the problem? The problem is, if you walk around going, well, God said I didn't kill. I didn't exactly kill him. You know, I maybe only smacked him around a little bit and maybe hurt him and maybe he's lame, but I did not kill him. And Jesus said, wait a minute. If you're showing up at the temple and you have a gift and you've done something against your brother, drop the gift. He does not say if somebody hurt you, you can't go. He says, if you hurt somebody else, you can't go. In other words, the thou shalt not kill law is be responsible. This should be a review to you guys who did the law, okay? Drop down and do the next one. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Look at verse 27, okay? You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Can I just say this, girls, for the sake of uh, argument here? He makes this a male thing. It is not only a male thing. If Fifty Shades of Grey taught us anything, it's that there's plenty of women out there lusting. Okay? Here's the bottom. I'm just saying, because we got to walk around. We, gotta, we, got, we always make this like a one-sided deal here. But I can tell you there's not a guy in this room that thinks any guy would have gotten out of junior high with eyes. <laughs> Am I wrong? So here's what I want you to know. What does he say? If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. What is the one place you can never go the rest of your life if you're missing an eye and you're a Jew? Temple. He says it would be better that you disqualified yourself from temple worship the rest of your life than if you walk in with lust in your heart because I want your body, but if I don't have your heart, I'm not impressed with your attendance. There's a principle behind it. I want you to show up. I'm glad you show up. Great. But here's the thing. You can lust in church. I'm not impressed by you showing up if what you're doing is honoring me with your lips while your heart is far from me. That doesn't work for me, says God. Now he's not saying, I used to be against adultery and now I'm not. He's saying you missed the principle. The principle of adultery is I want to be the center of your heart. And if you make your physical lust the center of your heart, then I'm not the center of your heart. 
and it's just another form of idolatry. Do not surrender Jesus for this. I'm not telling you you don't have felt needs. I'm saying don't surrender Jesus for felt needs because you're giving up and living the wrong life. Keep going. Verse 31. Whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Okay, what's the certificate of divorce for? The Hebrew formula was, I am not your husband, you are not my wife. And the reason behind it would be what? Well, adultery would be a reason or can't bear children, something. But what is the certificate of divorce for? Ladies, what do you use it for? Okay, in Deuteronomy 24, verse 2, when you get married again, and you will, you will bring that with you to your marriage. And this says, my first husband divorced me because I couldn't bear children. Why do you present that to the second husband? So he can't divorce you for the same cause. It's the protection for the woman. So the certificate of divorce was designed not to make divorce easy, but in order for certain things to be protected, particularly the woman who was weak in the negotiation. I want, I want to use an illustration, and I want to be careful about how I use it, but I think you're going to understand what I mean. Can anybody draw a line between contraception and immorality? The fact that you can now have sex and take a pill did what to American morality? It meant that people could solve the problem because they defined the problem as the result of the sex, not the problem as the violation of the body. You understand what I'm saying? The intention was to help medically. The outcome was a deluge of immorality. Why? Because now you can do what you want and not pay the price. Or so it seems. But biblically speaking, the act itself has a price. And that's the part that the world doesn't see. Why do I mention that? Because what was intended to do one thing had a huge effect somewhere else. What was intended to protect a woman if she couldn't bear children with her husband to make sure she was not repeatedly put off like the woman at the well who had been after one guy after another had divorced her, somebody wasn't following the law. And that protection became a discussion among the rabbis as to how you could get rid of a wife if she burned your dinner. And that wasn't God's intention. That was never God's intention. God just did not want anyone under the law, did not want a woman under the law to be unprotected. So he said, if you're going to do this, write a, write a certificate, give it to her so that the second time she walks in with a predisclosure and cannot be put off for a second time. Because I want her protected. Because this can't be a male-run thing where you just run her to the ground and swap off wives. We're not doing that. Now, the point is that I say to you, everyone who divorces his wife except for the reason of unchastity makes her commit adultery. In other words, women didn't choose divorces in the first century. Men put them in that situation. So if you, out of the hardness of your heart, took the wife of your youth and said, I will not be her husband, she will not be my wife, then at least understand that you're putting her in a terrible position if it's not because of something she did. You're, you're forcing her into a life to go step into another relationship that is going to actually bear on her back extra weight and it's not her fault and that's just wrong you guys it's not that it it's not that you can't do it it's that you're actually harming her when I gave you the law of divorcement what I was trying to do was protect her and you're using it to harm her and you've totally missed the principle of what it is I'm doing let me do another one um, verse 33 You've heard it said, the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, you but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, do not make any oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Uh, that's before they had Clairol. And But let your statement be yes, yes, no, no, anything beyond these is of evil. Does that say that Jesus said signing a contract is wrong? 
or swearing an oath in a courtroom is wrong. Is that what he's saying? No, what he's saying is, you heard them say, fulfill your vows to the Lord. But what I was actually trying to say is, when you talk, mean what you say. That's what I was trying to say. The principle is as simple as, stop fooling around with your words. Don't be, you know, if I, well, I said it to you, Pierce, but, but my fingers were like this behind my back, and so that means I didn't mean it. Because here's the thing. Just mean what you say and say what you mean. That's what I was telling you. Fulfill your vows. Don't open your mouth to me if you don't mean what you say. The Lord is in his temple. Here am I on earth. Let my words be few. Walk carefully when you enter the temple of the Lord your God. Why should your mouth make a fool of you? In other words, think before you pray. Let me say it very carefully. There are some people that pray to their own hurt. They open their mouth and they start talking to God before they thought about what they said. Then they made promises to God and then they didn't do them and they're worse off because they did. So shut up until you figured out what it is you're trying to say. Then talk to God about what you really are really honestly going to do and then do it. And don't wait. Do it. Get on top of it. Do it. So he says... Uh, you know, you heard uh, verse 38, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. What's that law? The law of the scales, scales or balances. It's a national law that says if a guy steals an orange, don't cut off his head. It's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But here's the thing. You turned it into a revenge standard. Well, you took out my eye, I get yours. That's not what I was saying. I was saying in the law, let the punishment fit the crime. They were out five minutes past curfew. Don't execute them. Ground them for a night or something. Come on. Don't get crazy. So he says, I say to you, do not resist an evil person. You turn this into, they hit me, I'm going to hit them back because it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's not what I was saying. I was saying, let the punishment fit the crime. And you listened to the list of what I said, but you did not hear what I meant. You heard it, but you didn't hear it. Then he says, um, verse 43, You've heard that it was said, and notice he doesn't say that Scripture says it, but you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And it's kind of interesting because in the Qumran scrolls, we find for the first time, a, it's a commentary on Deuteronomy 23. I want you to mark next to hate your enemy, commentary on Deuteronomy 23, verses 3 through 6. Then it says, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And Jesus said, listen, nationally speaking, nations had to defend themselves. But my disciples are going to have to watch me nailed to a cross and put your swords away and knock it off. And that's going to be hard. And if you can't do that, you can't be my disciple. See, so that you may be the sons of your father who's in heaven, he's the one who causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, God benefits people that aren't lo loving him at all. Today in Sebring, most people don't know God, but they got the same sunshine you did. Because God is good to them. What does that say? Then be good to them. Don't just be good to people who believe what you believe. Be good to everybody. Now, at the same time, he comes and he stops and he says, all right, I've gone through all the uh, these, these statements about the way I want you to practice your discipleship. I'm going to do very, the next section very quickly, so hang on. 6, 1 to 7, 12 are eight commitments or practices that belong to disciples. Can you pick them out? The first one is in 6, 1 through 4. Work for me, or let me just say, you, ha you serve an audience of one. You serve an audience of one. What do I mean by that? Like, yeah, exactly. So he says in verse 1, don't practice your righteousness before men. When you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet. <laughs> Listen, don't, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Not mean be totally unplanned, but... Don't make a big deal out of it. I am giving to the poor. May you all see the righteousness of this man as I give to the poor. 
says, look, do what you got to do and keep it, keep it a secret. Let your father see it. it. Because you serve an audience of one. Stop doing it for other men. Because when you're doing it for other men, you're not doing it for me. Then he says in verses 5 to 15, I need you to pray for one. Does everybody know what it means to pray for the other people in the room? Oh, I don't mean praying for them. I mean pray for the benefit of the hearers in the room and not for God. Is anybody lost on this? Oh, God, thou who hast dwelt in the hills from ages past. Here's the thing. There's a difference between talking to God and talking to everybody else in the room, but ostensibly talking to God. He says, I don't really need you to put on a show. Talk to me or don't. Verse 5 says it. And it's very flat the way he says it. Stop being a hypocrite. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I, I'm not interested in that. When you pray, do it quietly and in secret. Closet by yourself. It doesn't need to be anybody knowing what you're doing. You can, you can be doing anything else at the same time. You have to understand Middle Easterners. There are five prayers a day for a Muslim. You know what they do to pray? A guy gets up, Allah Akbar, and then they grab their mats, and they all, it's a big production. Allah Akbar, Allah. And Jesus said, that's just not my followers. You want to be my disciple? Pray. But make it something that's about me and not about everybody else. Will you please? And he says, in fact, I want you to learn to pray this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Start with the person of God. Start with the person of God. Don't start with your problems. Start with the person of God. Okay. Hallowed be your name. And so now there's the praise that belongs to the person of God. God, you're not like me. That's Hallowed is the word for holy, which is the word for distinct, which is the word for not like me. God, you're not like me. Stop in the beginning before you start asking me for anything and acknowledge that I'm not like you and you're not like me. See, that surrenders from the beginning of the prayer that I don't know how things should go. God, I'm not going to command you to do it because I don't know how it's supposed to go. So here's what I know. You're not like me, and I'm not like you, and that means uh, I'm going to come to you, and I'm going to say stuff, and if it's dumb, God, just know my heart because I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Your kingdom come. What's that? That's the purposes of God. Your kingdom come. So before I start giving him what I need, I start talking about the person of God and the praise of God and the purposes of God. What God, you're moving, you have a kingdom, you have a plan, I'm watching for the kingdom. Then it says, uh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He says, honestly, I'm looking for your program, the program of God. What's the program of God? Whatever you want. The program today will be written by God. Whatever you'd like, God, that's what I want. <coughs> Brought to you by God. And honestly, he says, I want it to be like it is in heaven. How is it in heaven? When God speaks, it's done. There's no negotiation. There's not like three angels going, I don't know if I, I really don't know if I feel like I'm up to that task. Can you believe he asked me to do that? I mean, I just... I am busy today. I do not have time for what God is asking me to do. That's not heaven. God speaks, done. He says, I want you to pray that things are done among us and my disciples right here on earth the way it is in heaven. God, whatever you want today, that's it. If that means my car doesn't work then that, and that's what you want, that's fine with me. If that means my foot aches all day and that's what you want, then I'm fine with that. I just need you to tell me what you want me to do and I'll do that. Then you go past the program of God and by that time you get to give us this day. Now you're looking for the provision of God, right? Give us this day our daily bread. The provision of God. Did you notice you don't ask God for a blessed thing in the prayer until you've already told him who he is and that you praise him and that you understand he's got a purpose and a program that he's working. And then you say, God, I have these needs and you told me to tell you what I need, so I, this is what I need. And then you get to forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtor. You're asking for what? The pardon of God. God, 
pardon me from the things I've done, but forced into that statement, I will therefore pardon the people who have done against me. In other words, in Jesus' prayer, you don't have a right to ask for forgiveness if you have an unforgiving spirit towards somebody else. Don't ask God to forgive you while you refuse to forgive somebody else. Don't ask him. You know what the answer is? No. You forgive, and then I will. God has a right to say no. We, we forget that as Christians, because we think everything has to be so grace-y that he just has to like do what we want. Here's what he says. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil or from the evil one. It's difficult to read the text to know exactly what he means. But here's the bottom line. Do not lead us into temptation is literally, Lord, I'm asking you now for protection. I would not have translated the Greek phrase, do not lead us into temptation. It's not how I would have translated it. But it's, it's generally the idea of, um, Lord, protect us from the ever-present temptation. It's probably how I would translate the passage. Protect us from ever-present temptation. Um, he's, he's not, the word lead us is a little bit, it's a little bit of a, an old King Jamesian way of saying something that I think doesn't really communicate where he's going. Why? Because you have the power to do it. You have the power. Yours, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. God, I'm asking for provision. I'm asking for pardon. I'm asking for protection because you have the power. So you end on the power of God and you began on the, per, on the, on the person of God. Do you see it? When you pray, your need is sandwiched in the inside between the two layers of bread. It's sandwiched between... The, the person of God and the power of God and your problem is stuck in the middle. That's how you pray. And when you pray that way, you've already acknowledged that God has a purpose and a program that's bigger than you and you may not even know what it is. And so what you're not saying is, God, I demand that you do this. I'm a Christian. If you get into a Bible study with somebody who does that, run, don't walk to the nearest exit. Because what you're asking for is something really not good. Don't Tell God how to run the universe. Bottom line, I stand over the baby. The baby's sick, and I say, Lord, I want you to deliver this baby. I do. I, I can't fix this baby. And the doctors can't fix this baby. You can fix this baby. Here's what I don't know. Is this baby supposed to be fixed? That's what I don't know, because I don't know. So the pattern of prayer is the Garden of Gethsemane in John 18. Lord, deliver this cup for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. In other words, here's what I want, but what I really want is whatever you want. So make whatever I want, what you want, and what you want, what I want, and I'll follow you. I'll just fall into your arms. Because sometimes, sometimes babies have to die. You don't know anybody 212 years old. There's a reason, because they all died. And at some point, some sickness they prayed for to get well didn't work. No, that God said no. Why? Because he doesn't want 212-year-olds running around. Besides, honestly, at 212, you're not doing much running, okay? Now, I'm not trying to be heartless. What I'm trying to say to you is you can't always get a yes to your prayer. You can't because it doesn't tell God's story. It tells yours. And the whole foundation of the story is this is who I am, not who you are. Okay, let's, um, let's step back and say, okay, so my, I have a commitment to giving for one. I have a commitment to praying for one. Get out of the 16 to 18. What's this one? I have, a, I have a commitment to doing what for one? Fasting. Fasting for one. So I avoid the outward shows in verse 16. I don't try to, 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 to show everybody in verses 16 and 17. I deliberately hide. the. In other words, I allow my walk with God to be a private walk with God. That's the reason I told you. Don't, don't hang it all out there. Not everything goes on Facebook. Okay? There's stuff you don't have to share with each other. And, and we're living in a time when, frankly, even between men and women, you guys, you, you tell each other too much. Keep the mysteries mystery, okay? Just, just keep some stuff for yourself. There's some stuff that's, girls, can, can we all agree there's some stuff for other girls that aren't for guys? Now, it's kind of cool when you can kind of be out there on the edge. Don't be. So I give for one, I pray for one, I fast for one. Now on 6, 19 to 24, I save in the right place. What's the right place to save? Store up for yourselves 
all the stuff that Stuff Mart can sell you and go and get storage garage and barns and fill them with stuff, right? Yeah, no. If moths can get to it or rust can get to it, then you're in the wrong place. What kind of stuff are you supposed to store up? Yeah, and how do you do that exactly? What's he, is he just saying like cute stuff for kids in Sunday school? What's he saying? What does that mean? No, it really isn't. We're on the planet for a short time. Uh, take a good look. I'm twice your age, and you're going to blink and be mine. You're going to blink and be my age. And then all of a sudden, you're going to blink and be my dad's age. Uh, my point is, you're not here for a long time. Don't, don't bury yourself in the rental. It's just a rental. Okay? Some people are spending so much money on the rental. For crying out loud, it's a motel. Don't redecorate. Just live there for a while. And here's the thing. There's so many people that are, their whole life is about the decoration. Guys, look. Plastic is only going to do so much. You're only going to look so good for so long, and then you're not. And that's the truth. So get used to the fact that there is something more important than this life. Okay, how about this one? In verses 25 to 34, where do we place our trust? Trust appropriately. Where's the right place to put trust? 25 to 34. You need to trust my father, Jesus said. You can't be my disciple if you're going to run around worrying all the time about where everything's going to come from. I know people that incessantly worry and think it's Christian, and it's not. I'm not saying don't get a job. I'm not saying don't have a savings account. I'm not saying don't plan a retirement. What I am saying is, at the end of the day, your money can be gone that fast. I mean, I live in a country where, frankly, you can spend your whole life working up to something, get sick, and lose it all. That's just the way it is. So if you're going to put your trust in the mighty dollar, forget it. If you're going to put it in real estate, forget it. If you're going to put it in... The physical body. Forget it. All that stuff is temporary. Learn to see what God has called me to do and then trust that God will provide. Because where God guides, God provides. And that's the way it is. Don't worry about it. God has the ability to meet your basic needs. Don't be walking around going, what am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? Now, I'm not saying, like, don't plan what you wear. Right? You know, because some of you, honestly, you need a plan. Let's move on. Um, you get the seven, one to five. We're almost done. This is the sixth one, seven, one to five. Examine properly our companions. Let me put it another way. Pick your friends. What do I mean? Do not judge so that you will not be judged does, is the most misused verse in the Bible. Well, Jesus says you can't judge anybody. Listen, you don't even know if you belong with them if you haven't spent any time judging whether or not their life is what you belong with because bad company corrupts good morals. So he's not saying, walk around going, oh, I, I don't want to say anything that could be possibly offensive to anyone. Did you ever read Jesus? He offends a lot of people. Paul followed Jesus and Paul offended a lot of people. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, if you don't want the judgment of others, keep your mouth shut about them. Because people will use the standard you use against them against you. And then he says... For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by the standard of measure, you will be measured. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but not move the log out of your own eye? In other words, until you got your life together, stop giving people advice. Stop walking around telling them how they need to do it differently when you are walking around in a mess. Don't give marriage advice when you're on your third marriage. Don't give me banking advice when you're bankrupt. Show a pattern that you actually have it going in your life before you start telling me. The seventh one, verse 6. Carefully guard God's truth. Where do I get that? Don't give what is holy to dogs. Don't throw your pearls before swine. Listen, there's a mistake my generation made. I apologize for it, and I don't want to see you make it as well. Do not, do not, do not invest yourself in making America moral. That's not our job. Our job isn't to try and make unsaved people look like saved people. That's putting lipstick on a pig. You're not going to fix them. Your job is to give the gospel, and it starts on the inside and works its way out. What I don't want you to do is invest in America to try to get it to be more moral. What I do want you to do is put Jesus out there in everything you do. 
and make sure people see Jesus and that it's a winsome and loving and gracious, but nevertheless true representation of what Jesus said. Last one, uh, 7 through 12. This sounds like a redux or a reaction to an earlier one, but confidently seek God's provision. In verse 7, he says this, he says 7 through 12, Ask, it'll be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Does that mean whatever I want, I just go, hey, God, I need it. Give it to me. It means if I'm following what God told me to do, then God is responsible for taking care of what I need to get it done. So I walk into it and I go, God, you called me to do this. I have no way of doing this without you helping me get it done. There is no way I can get this done. So here's what I'm going to do. If you want me to do it, I'm right here. I'm ready to be obedient. Now provide what is, what is necessary or I can't get it done. Can I just tell you flat out, I'm being straight with you. Try it. God will always show up. He will always show up. I'm telling you, I haven't had a real job in 15 years. He will show up. But you got to get out there on the front and you got to say, look, Lord, I know what exactly you want done. I have prayed through this. I have watched it. I see your hand in it. I know you want it done. I don't have what it's going to take to get it done. I need you to do it. You're on year 10 of a school that started with $300 in the bank. Now, don't be lazy. Don't use that as an excuse to go, well, God, you know, it's just send me to the mission field, write the check, and put it in my box. How about you go out and do a little deputation and do a little work for it? How about you invest yourself in it, okay? So what's interesting is, he goes on and says, we have to ask for what we need in verses 7 and 8, but then we also have to understand something about God. Before we go to a break, hang in there because this is a big one. Lots of Christians think God is stingy. They do. They're disciples of Jesus and they think God is a tight wad in heaven. Listen to what he says. What man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? You've got to believe that you serve a good God who knows what you need and cares about you. We've got a lot of believers out there going, yeah, they're Zachariah Christians. Yeah, God, he answers the prayer of other people. He doesn't answer my prayers. Fine, I'll mix this incense. In Jesus' name. Push. Here's the thing. You, you get off the page that God is stingy. I am telling you, you will not outgive God and you will not believe how God gives you. There were four different ends to the invitation. Did you catch them? There's two gates. There's a big one everybody goes through. That's in 7, 13, and 14. And then there's a tiny one. I want you to choose the little one, not the big one. In other words, don't go the way everybody else is going and think you're going to get to where you need to go. It's not going to happen. My way is not going to be the majority way. Why, why are Christians surprised when the world doesn't embrace us? It's not like they like Jesus. Honestly, nailed to a cross, that's a pretty definite sign they didn't like you. They don't want a standard of God. They don't want one. So don't walk onto a college campus and think that we can somehow make Jesus cool enough to be relevant to their lives and all of a suddenly they'll just throw their arms around us. You try to modify the message of Jesus to make him cool enough to be acceptable to a college student and you no longer have the Jesus of the Bible. Because the Jesus of the Bible wants a sacrifice and nobody wants to do sacrifice. How about the two fruit trees? That's in verses 15 to 20. He says, um, got to be aware of false prophets. There's a lot of people out there talking, but some of them are wolves in sheep's clothing. Verse 16, you'll know them by their fruit. You want to know what somebody is? Look at the fruit of their life. Look at the fruit of their life. Don't just listen to their words. Look at the fruit of their life. He says, he says, listen, grapes aren't gathered from thorn bushes. Figs don't come from thistles. There's a certain kind of tree you got to grow to get a certain kind of fruit. So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. This, this beats up parents and beats me up all the time. Here's the thing. We desperately want you guys to, to grab on to the truth of God's word and to live as a believer. But the point is you grow right choices. What does that mean? Why am I making a point to say you grow right choices? 
See, everybody wants to talk about how well, it was a mistake. I, I got caught up in the moment and it was a mistake. Yeah, but the 10 decisions you made before that are the reason you got there. You grow right choices. Starting way back here, like, should I do my homework tonight or go to the party? Well, if I choose homework, then I'll have the benefit of doing it. If I choose party, well, then I have a certain problem because I'm going to have to look down away from Pastor Randy all day because he's going to know I didn't do it. And then I'm going to go to the party. Now, should I be with these people or should I not be with these people? Should I stay at the party until others that I'm familiar with are gone and I'm alone? Should I? It's the, the bad choice wasn't the last choice. It was 10 choices back. You grow right fruit. And that's the two confessions. That's in verses 21 to 23. A true disciple won't just speak as though they know me. They'll live according to my teaching. A wise man builds his house on a rock. A foolish man builds his house on the sand. Two foundations. That's in 24 to 29. So you got two gates, two trees, two confessions, two foundations. In other words, in three words, make your choice. So he closes with a great invitation. Haddon Robinson wrote this, and then we'll go to a break. Some people are attracted to Christianity because they have a leaky faucet that they want God to fix. Perhaps they struggle with a destructive habit, and they would like to tap into God's power to help them break it. Maybe they have broken relationships that they want God to mend, but they learn from the Sermon on the Mount that God is not a plumber. Leaky faucets are a minor league problem to him. God wants to tear all of your plumbing out and entirely deal from the well and the source of the water that flows all the way through and change what comes out of your faucet, not simply stop your leak. God doesn't want to fix your leak. He wants to rip out the plumbing and replace it all. So the point is that there's a choice. And that choice is what you can do to be a disciple of Jesus.